Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Arni and this is Simon and we are from Easy and Cheat. Uh, sorry. Uh, so just quickly first, something about us, who we are, why are we here. Uh, so Easy and Cheat started as a third party solution for Counter-Strike. Uh, nowadays we're a team of 14 people uh, and we have a long history dealing with game hacking. Uh, in-house, we have three dedicated teams. We have one team working on client-side and cheat approaches. We have one team working on server-side uh, player behavior analysis. And we have one team working on machine learning that kind of sits between these two teams and helps each other. Uh, we're currently working with around 30 games, many in the Steam platform uh, from different genres like FPS shooters, MOBA, uh, MMORPG, and so on. So we see a wide spectrum in cheating. Uh, so in this talk, we're going to cover with uh, what is cheating, who is doing it, why are they doing it, uh, how is it done, uh, and then lastly, uh, what is anti-cheating. OK, so let's talk about cheating. Um, so we define cheating as gaining an unfair advantage. Um, Cheating has always been present in competitive activities. Um, think of card games, uh, Monopoly, any sports. Um, and probably everyone in this room has cheated at least once in their life. Even if it's just for winning a game of Monopoly against like, your bigger brother. Um, cheating might also happen in gambling or anything with monetary incentives. Um, and if we compare online cheating versus offline cheating, um, it's very different. In an offline world, we have social structures, uh, real-world consequences if you cheat. Uh, while on the internet, not much of this um, is in place. There's uh, anonymity, and it's really easy to hide that you're cheating. Um, also, over the years, cheating in online gameplay um, has been increasingly, uh, become increasingly easier to do um, as the software became more available, more accessible. Um, as a result, we also see that player communities uh, more often see cheating as something acceptable. Um, let's try this video. Yeah. This is a short video of someone more like rage cheating. Um, it's accelerated just to make it easier to watch. Um, this guy is using many different cheats. Uh, one of them is the chameleon hack. Um, so we see that the player models, they change color depending on team um, and also visibility within the map. Uh, there's also an ESP uh, giving information on player names, uh, what weapon someone is carrying, um, uh, the skeleton and, and so on. Um, and if you watch really closely, then you will also notice that even though this guy is headshotting everyone, the crosshair actually doesn't move. So this is kind of a usability thing in the cheat, like making it more pleasant to just rage the server. Um, and you can see that clearly for the other players in this same game, this isn't fun. Um, so in cheating itself, uh, the definition of an unfair advantage and what's not allowed or what is allowed, it's very game and context dependent. Um, so we kind of put it on a like a spectrum of types of cheats. Uh, one is like exploits, um, like pixel walking or stacking. Um, it's generally not a big problem, um, unless than in actual tournaments or competitive gameplay. Um, we also have a lot of automation cheats, uh, like macroing, uh, automating a sequence of key presses. Um, in many games it's acceptable, in some it's not. Um, in the same category, we also have aimbotting, triggerbotting, um, basically anything that uh, automates user actions. Um, overlays, like we saw in the previous video, you have ESP giving more information. Um, then you also have things like a radar hack, giving uh, details on where people are located within the map. Um, and then things like warning hacks, telling you um, if an enemy is aiming at you, if uh, someone sees you, and so on. Um, and finally, you also have the type of cheats that completely manipulate how the game is played. Uh, fly hacks, speed hacks, uh, no clipping, 
uh, anything that really hacks into the game to enable you to cheat. Um, and so why is this relevant? Basically, it's, it's all about the player. Like what we want when making games is that people say it's a great game, you get good reviews, everyone's positive about the game. Um, also taking a quick look at the business model, um, players basically discover your game in the store. They play it, they get excited about it, they continue playing it, they also tell their friends, um, and so on. And these reviews, they will also help in like, accelerated acquisition of new players. Um, all of this is supposed to result in revenue, which you reinvest in either player retention um, through game content, game features, or then in player acquisition with advertising. Or then alternatively, you put it into the next game you're making. Um, then what we don't want to see is basically, it's not working. Mm -hmm. is reviews like this. Um, basically saying this game should be removed from Steam because of bad management, cheats, and bugs. Um, most likely this player will stop playing the game. He will also stop telling his friends to play the game, and eventually the bad reviews will uh, lead into reduced player acquisition. Um, as a result, like, any good business model is, like, goes in cycles. The more revenue you make, the more game content you can produce, the, and again, like, more revenue you make. And when you end up in a kind of negative vicious cycle, it might be very hard to get out of it. Um, so if you look at like who's triggering this in terms of cheating, um, let's first define some terms, uh, just for the sake of this presentation also. So we have hackers, providers, and cheaters. Um, the cheaters, they are the guys, the players, the users of the cheats, and they use software produced by hackers. So these guys, um, they create the features, they create the injection techniques to inject into the game, um, and basically do all the R&D related to cheats. Um, and then in between, um, as a distribution platform kind of, like as a publisher, you have the providers. They take care of the branding of the cheats, uh, they do community management, they take care of the payment portals. Um, if they're really big, Publishers, they might do localization uh, to basically cover more, more countries. Um, and it's important to differentiate clearly, at least between hackers and cheaters. Like, they are not the same. Cheaters use the hacks, and hackers create those, uh, the software. Um, looking at cheaters, we identify some key profiles. Um, the most famous one, I guess, is the griefers. These are the guys who will, on a Friday evening, buy a six-pack of beer, uh, buy 10 game accounts, and just grieve through every single one of them, rage-hacking every server. Uh, luckily, this is just a minority of the cheaters. Uh, I would say the vast majority are casual cheaters. Um, these are the guys who just want to make the game easier, more pleasant to play for themselves. They don't necessarily want to ruin the experience for everyone else. Um, and these are the type of guys who will also tend to cheat in every single game they play. Um, then you've also got the achievers who just want to win every competition. They don't want to get caught for cheating. And then a group that's often overlooked are the vigilantes and followers, as we call them. Um, vigilantes are your type of player that fall victim to cheating. And then they go online, they Google their own cheat, and they will just revenge for the harm done to them. Um, and then the followers, they are often your very passionate player base. Um, kind of when things get out of hand, they just want to keep playing the game and they want to level the playing field so it remains fun for them. Uh, later on, when we talk about um, anti-cheat strategies, it's also like, think about these profiles because some of these players you want to ban and remove from your game forever, while others you just want to protect them from themselves and just give them a good experience. Um, let's do the same for hackers. Uh, so we only identified three key pro uh, profiles. Uh, first one is scripters. This is the vast majority. They copy-paste whatever they find. They experiment a lot. Uh, they hack things together and just make simple cheats. Uh, then you've also got like your senior hackers. They are more professional. They make feature-rich cheats. They might commercialize them. And these guys are often really, really good coders. 
uh, or professional reverse engineers or anyone with a really strong background in like software development. Um, and then the final category we see a lot is uh, the researcher type. These are guys who just out of interest, uh, they pick up the challenge to reverse an anti-cheat or to reverse the game, and they focus on producing proof of concepts uh, rather than commercially viable cheats. Um, then the providers, they sit in between. Um, there it always starts with open communities uh, where you get a lot of free cheats. Uh, it's very easy to access them. And when you're a beginning game hacker, that's where you get your initial knowledge of how things are done. Um, then the cheat publishers themselves, uh, so they commercialize the, the cheats for the end user. Um, it's often also relatively easy to access, um, as long as you have PayPal or a credit, car credit card. And these cheats, they go for anything between $5 a month to something like $25 a month. Um, and then the final category, they are the closed communities with private cheats. Um, it's often really hard to get into those. Uh, it's reputation-based. You need to have references from already existing members or a good reputation in other communities. Uh, we also see things like um, you need to go through Skype interviews or send a copy of your passport so they know who you are when you screw them over. Um, and also with, this, with these private cheats, there's always limited availability. So only the first 20 buyers or the first 100 buyers can buy them. And it goes fairly expensive, like uh, something like $40 a month is not an exception. Um, and then in the same category, we also see the very private sheets, uh, where someone places a tender of anything between $500 and $1,000 to get a very private sheet. These sheets are often very simple in terms of features, like just an aimbot or only a wall hack, um, but they are very private and they are supposed to be completely undetectable. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it is a business and it's an industry. So it starts with public cheats, but it goes all the way to very exclusive, expensive cheats. If you look at the big commercial providers, uh, they are very often legitimate businesses. They are registered in their countries of residence for, as a real company. They pay taxes. Uh, they sometimes have management in place. Um, and checking the tax records of those companies, we see that a one-person hacker publisher can make anything between half a million and one million dollar a year. Um, for teams, it's generally higher. Uh, something like 1.5 million dollar is quite standard. Um, and we estimate the global market size is at least 100 million dollar. Um, so it's a fairly big industry and it also explains why game hackers, they are often so incentivized and so motivated to continue supporting games because it's Basically, it's their livelihood. It's how they make a living. Um, so if you look at cheats next. So, cheats. Uh, cheating often starts while just playing the game normally, naturally. So uh, probably most of us have played a game and then by accident found a game glitch, uh, something that gives you advantage over other players. For example, like uh, falling uh, under the map and suddenly seeing everyone while they can't see you, or you know, somehow becoming invisible to other players. Uh, there's also, while configuring games, uh, you might find uh, some unrestricted console variables or options. Uh, for example, you might find that the developer left accidentally a debug rendering mode, which allows to enable wireframe rendering that also shows entities through walls. Uh, also, probably, Many people have tried modifying, uh, for example, save game files on disk, you know, loading the game again and seeing like, oh, I have the whatever, unlimited values. Uh, these are usually relatively quick fixes. Uh, like you can fix this quickly, for example, enforcing uh, the valid variable values, uh, for example, shipping the game without debug console at all, and checking that, for example, like uh, if you, remo if you remove a text texture file on disk and it will give you wall hack effect, for example, the game client can verify that uh, this file must be loaded or otherwise, I don't know, it can crash or prevent playing. Um, so there also exists, exists uh, tools specific specifically designed uh, to get around these uh, restrictions. 
Uh, for example, with Cheat Engine, it's possible to modify the ammo, health, experience, uh, go around the value enforcements and bring up the debug console again. And the only real fix here really is authoritative game servers and uh, not shipping the game with debug options. A uh, common workaround is also to use code obfuscation uh, encrypting variables. Uh, this will make using these tools a bit harder. Uh, also, an anti-cheat uh, can prevent the underlying techniques that these tools use to work. Uh, for example, when enabling the speed hack module for cheat engine, uh, it will give an error. Uh, the program will fail while it leaves the game unaffected. So, how do you make cheats? Uh, just logging back my own history, uh, how I got into programming was really through cheating. So I was playing Counter-Strike, uh, it was one of my favorite games, and I saw some people were cheating. Uh, I would go to these open uh, cheat forums, they had tons of tutorials, examples, you know, how to make really complex cheats to how to just compiling program, because I had never, for example, installed Visual Studio in my life. Uh, so with just a couple of lines of code, copy paste of course, because I had no idea what I'm doing, uh, I was actually able to make a wall hack, or make, because it wasn't mine. Uh, I had no idea how the game worked. I actually didn't even understand until later, like, why the wall hack works. Uh, and it actually took me probably years before I looked into the actual game code and understood more how games work. And the big benefit of just uh, using OpenGL, Direct3D, and these kind of dependencies around the game engine was uh, that uh, I could also port this really easily to the next game, because most of the games are using OpenGL Direct3D, for example, for rendering. And I wouldn't have to worry about things like, uh, you know, the first anti-cheats, uh, you know, self-code uh, checks that the early games at that point had already. Um, so this is how, for example, this cheat looks here. It's around 20 lines of code in total if you have all the spaces and enters. And uh, this is basically the only thing you need for Counter-Strike, for example, or any other shooter game. You just need to see enemies through walls and bam. Uh, later on, uh, I would want to do more uh, better cheats, more advanced cheats, so I would learn how to do things like ESP cheats, uh, using the game engine to pull information out of it to show the player names, the weapons, uh, draw nice rectangles around the players and so on. So at that point, I got into hacking the game engines. Because again, uh, many games use the same engines, so I could support two or three games with the same hack. Another way, easy way to uh, programming and uh, coding cheats is uh, doing uh, bot programs. Uh, these programs, they automate gameplay. Uh, usually they target the network protocol uh, or they send emulated input to the game window. And they read the pixels and this way they are aware of the game state. Uh, for example, here is an example of a bot program. Uh, and this bot is actually completely external Python script. It has no real game code. It doesn't load the game itself. Uh, so even though, for example, here, the server actually validates the game client, and it kicks the left player here every 10 seconds, uh, the player will automatically just join the server again, farm from, for 10 seconds, and if you just do this 24-7, uh, seven days a week, you actually get really long in the game, really far. And for a real player, you know, this just looks weird, this is not fun, and you just see zombies walking around and all the time disappearing in the game. Uh, so what more advanced cheats can do is uh, they can also start adding new features to the games. For example, uh, doing an in-game hack menu so you can configure the cheat while playing. Uh, you can do nice overlays. And for example, uh, one of the cool things, uh, you can do uh, IRC windows in the game. Uh, and many cheats, for example, they actually have a snake game with the cheat so that while you're waiting on a matchmaking queue, you can, you know, kill time. So. They go, there's a lot of stuff, like Pong games and whatever. Uh, uh, the easiest is, of course, to inline patch the game code itself, for example, or, for example, if this was OpenGL rendering function. So you patch the code to jump uh, to the cheat code, uh, you do the deed, and then you jump back to the original game code. Another way of hooking things and hijacking the uh, code flow of the game is to, for example, uh, find the engine interfaces and switch these uh, function pointers. So instead of calling the original game code, they call the cheat implementation. 
Uh, the benefit, for example, with interface hooking is that uh, it usually survives better over game updates because the game engine usually uh, doesn't really do drastic changes. Uh, there's a lot more techniques also to achieve the same effect and you know, basically take control over the game. For example, uh, playing tricks with exception handling, uh, causing invalid game state, for example, writing on some dynamic data so that the game will crash, and then you have a legitimate exception handler that will fix the crash, restore the execution, and uh, process the data that was in that function you were interested in. Uh, you can also use things like hardware debug breakpoints that don't actually change any pointers. They don't change any code. They just tell the CPU that, hey, when you're reading this address or when you're executing this address, uh, I want an exception so I can handle it. Um, so there's tons of more techniques like this. Uh, they all have their pros and cons. Uh, next to injecting cheat features, uh, these te techniques are also used to protect the cheat itself. Uh, usually when protecting the cheats, uh, they also go to kernel mode. So they use techniques like direct kernel object manipulation, interrupt hooks, system service hooks, uh, virtual address descriptor uh, hiding, to basically hide a cheat from plain sight uh, or all the memory scanners and so on. And these techniques are usually uh, used also, also for the cheat DRM uh, to make reversing uh, the cheat harder, to do hardware locking. For example, uh, when you download and run any paid or private cheat, for the first time they will lock onto your PC. Uh, and the cheats have on their own dedicated backends which monitor the usage of the cheat. If you run the cheat, for example, three times within five minutes, uh, they will auto-lock the account and admin has to check what you've been doing. Uh, for example, if they detect that you're running debugger, uh, they won't stream the cheat to you anymore. It's game over. So you have to start again. Uh, and actually doing anti-cheat, uh, this is uh, often the most time-consuming part. And beyond this, uh, the really advanced cheats, they are also often very well designed software. They're modular, uh, they have many features that you can just plug and play in. Uh, the creators have strong knowledge of operating system internals, they have strong knowledge of the game engines. Uh, they might have, in max, have experience in uh, creating games. Um, and they, use, they hide deep in the kernel, they leave no traces, and they even use legitimate software uh, to load their cheat in a way that makes the cheat invisible to the system and again, harder to locate and reverse engineer. Uh, for example, this image here, it's from a vulnerable VirtualBox kernel driver, which has an unfortunate, uh, quite complex exploit that allows you to write arbitrary memory in kernel address space. So using this, uh, some cheats, they load, for example, unsigned hack drivers, they disable certain uh, security measures in the kernel, uh, and they, there's a lot of pre-made tools that uh, automate this exploiting process for you, so you kind of like plug and play in it. So, and the cheating. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one of the key things to understand about anti-cheating is that there is no such thing as an unhackable game. The cake is a lie. <laughs> And like the way we we personally look at like anti-cheating, it's like it's a strategy, and you need to carefully consider like what's creating the value of cheating. Like why are people doing it, and what's the cost of cheating? And if you can s uh, switch this risk-reward balance, then that's how you stop cheating. Um, so if we look at like how you re reduce the reward, decrease the value. Um, Early in the game design, you already want to start thinking about anti-cheat philosophies and how to incorporate anti-cheat by design. Um, a really good example of this is, um, is like Dota 2, uh, where they use the fog of war um, and basically on the server side already filter out all the player positions that are not visible to the player. So a cheat cannot create a map hack for this game. Um, other good examples are um, World of Tanks or uh, War Thunder, where the bullet projectiles are calculated server sites, and if you're cheating and aimbotting, then they correct your behavior. Um, this works great in current uh, PC games, um, and on our end, we're curious how this will go in VR, because there you cannot really um, correct the gameplay itself. 
Um, another one is game mechanics. A really good example there is um, Rust by Facepunch Studios. Um, it's a survival sandbox MMO game. Um, and there you have groups of people who are solo players spending days and days grinding, gathering resources and building large bases. These bases, they hold all their loot um, and they have doors that can only be unlocked with key codes. Um, what players then uh, started doing is um, to actually brute force these four digit key codes. Um, so either they would manually, with a lot of patience, go through all the possible combinations, or they would use something like auto hotkey to automate this and just crack it within seconds. Um, how they solved it was to, um, like with, this, with a very small game change, um, every time you input the wrong code, you would get an electric sho shock as a player. And the more you input the wrong code, the bigger the shock gets, and after something like five to ten times, you die. So this effectively killed all brute forcing. Um, so next to reducing the reward, you can also think about you know, how to increase the risk. Again, some examples. Uh, something like game price, I wouldn't say it's part of your anti-cheat strategy, but it's anyway one of the factors that really influence how people cheat in your game. Um, if they pay $60 uh, for the game copy, then it's very unlikely that they will get banned two, three times in a row, because it gets really, really expensive. Um, Free-to-play or games that cost something like $20, they are way more vulnerable, um, especially if you do like Humble Bundle or if there are accounts on G2A that cost something like $2 or $3. Um, then you've also got uh, account value itself. Um, like Steam profiles, their people tend to collect a lot of games, they want to grow their reputation, they gain friends, uh, they begin trading, and so on and so on. And then when they have this label on this profile, with like one game ban, um, it makes them look really bad in the community. Um, and for this, Valve actually provides uh, several APIs to help in cheating, or in anti-cheating. Uh, one of them is the request player game ban. It's really trivial to use, it's just one HTTP call uh, to ban Steam profiles, like the one in the screenshot. Uh, what they also provide on the Steam partner website is that you can configure your favorite anti-cheat. Um, so then the anti-cheat can take care of all the API integrations. Um, another one to consider is uh, ranked matchmaking, tiered gameplay. Um, if players have to level up for several days bef before entering the more competitive uh, like player base, um, it means that when they get banned, it's very tedious, it's very time-consuming, like it's a grind to get back where they were. So it easily gets boring to do it over and over again. Um, so in some games we see examples of uh, the first 20 hours you need to play on a beginner server before you can enter the real servers. Um, you can also use this in a way that's like kind of a forced tutorial, which is interesting and fun for new players. Um, and then if you have done it 10, 20 times as a cheater, then it gets really boring. Um, one more is, uh, oh yeah, so one other approach is also um, like actually focusing on the cheats themselves. Like when you reduce the supply, you actually inflate the cheat price, which makes it again more costly. And then this is where um, like anti-cheat comes in. Um, so basically all anti-cheats, they will detect cheats. And there's many different ways of doing it. Uh, one of them is statistics, which is a really great way of uh, getting griefers out of the game. Um, all those who cheat very obviously, you can just kick them instantly or ban them. Um, the great benefit of this is that it's also completely server-side. Um, but then you hit the limits when, uh, when your best players start to overlap with very smooth cheaters. Um, another really common way is uh, signature scanning. This is very comparable to um, like traditional antivirus approach. So you, the process basically goes that uh, the anti-cheat will collect the cheat, will make a signature, uh, carefully crafted so that it doesn't uh, conflict or false positive with legit software. And then during runtime, the memory will be scanned for these signatures. Um, 
it works great, but again, has also a downside of um, like you actually need to know the cheats you're looking for. Um, so then a third approach is to use heuristics, which is um, you don't actually look for specific cheats, but instead of scanning for patterns, you just look for code flow behavior. You look where do the system calls land or how does the engine behave um, and is everything normal like it should be played. And then this gives you indicators of uh, is someone cheating or not. And again, has a downside, and that's um, it conflicts if there's a rootkit installed or a virus, you might be triggered that way. So in a way, like uh, none of these three are perfect, so you kind of want to combine them in different ways uh, to like close all the loopholes. Um, then, so for detecting cheats, for most detection methods, you actually need to discover the cheat first. Um, and for this, um, by far the largest uh, or the most well-known cheating scene would be uh, US and Europe, and then also Russia, which is a bit more isolated. So for there, like it's relatively easy to infiltrate and get those cheats and get signatures for them. Um, but then beyond that, you also have very closed communities or for us, like um, we're based in Finland and we see a lot of uh, cheat communities, for example, in Korea, China, um, Thailand, Philippines, any of those like Southeast Asian countries, which are due to the language barrier and culture barrier. It might be hard to infiltrate and get those cheats. Um, so what most standard cheats will do is that they allow players to report cheat binaries. Um, so when they are reported, they can look into them, reverse them and so on. Um, then also manual scanning of uh, cheat forums and cheat providers, trying to get those cheats, cracking the DRM and going through all the holes. Um, and then finally also um, modern anti-cheats start to move in a direction of machine learning, where you use the heuristics to just discover um, what could be a new cheat, what couldn't be. Like you start clustering uh, like outliers or border cases and the heuristics and find that oh, here's 100 or 200 players with the same strange looking data. And then from there you look into if you manually can discover what cheat they were using. Um, then also cheat prevention is one of the key things that you see in a lot of uh, anti-cheat services. And um, there's several ways of doing it. A very common one, which is always kind of the first step, is to use code obfuscation. Uh, that gets rid of uh, a lot of the standard tools that are used to create cheats. Um, but then the more advanced hackers, they will get around it. So there you also see a lot of, uh, like the kernel anti-cheats, the kernel mode ones, they will sandbox the process itself and prevent uh, common injection techniques and prevent, for example, that an external process can get a handle to your game process or that the process can read the memory and so on. Then um, also an important part of anti-cheat is that you need to be able to update it constantly because it will always be under attack. So you need a good way of shipping updates. Um, so either this is tied together with uh, game updates um, or then independently, which you can do with most of the anti-cheat techniques. Like when you use statistics, then you change the server rules, signatures, you can scan the new database files, or then with heuristics, you can stream the modules that check the certain code flow. Um, then also we know that a lot of uh, studios are doing it themselves. Um, we've heard many stories, so we thought of just inputting some really quick advice and like um, some thoughts. Um, one, the first one is like when you do it yourself, make sure to protect your company assets. Uh, you want to isolate the machines on which you run cheats. Also the network, you want to physically isolate it. And then you also want to always use a VPN. So your IP cannot be tracked by the cheat providers. Um, then also like make sure to protect your sensitive information. Like don't log in on Gmail when you have a cheat running. Uh, they might be able to get your um, email, your password, and basically steal all your personal information. Same for Skype. Skype stores the Skype logs on disk. So it, it's fairly trivial to just collect them and upload them. Uh, things like payment data, they will get your credit card. 
Um, and then also with source code, some cheats, they might uh, look for C and CPP files and just uplo upload them to their backend. Um, also, when you begin doing this, make sure to scope and allocate the resources um, and be ready for like a never-ending battle. Um, and that's part of like, uh, like the next part is this, like staying in control. Um, which basically, you have to have the mindset that challengers, they will always appear. There will always be someone who tries to crack your solution. Um, so like, how do you deal with this? Um, first one is to, um, to have like community management. Make sure when you have cheaters, acknowledge it to the players. Like, don't start denying it and show commitment that you will fix this. Um, on the other hand, also avoid added publicity for cheating. Um, like we usually don't recommend to announce ban waves and those things um, because no number is a good number. If you have a ban wave of say 12,000 cheaters, people will say that this is too much, everyone's cheating in this game, I should cheat too. If your ban wave is really small and you have something like 200 players that cheated, then you will get criticized that you didn't catch everyone. So it's better to just keep going and players will notice in game when there are no more cheaters. Um, in the same way, also make no promises or claims because you can basically not promise that like, next week this will be fixed. Uh, you can aim for it, but there's no way to keep it, the promise. Um, and then also make sure to keep the focus on game content. Uh, with forums and Reddit, you don't want the normal threads about the game itself. You don't want them to get buried under an avalanche of uh, cheat-related threads. So it's better to aggregate, give them a platform where they can talk, but also make sure that the game content itself um, like, keeps getting focus. Um, then in the, game, in the game design phase, um, make sure to plan ahead. Look at trusting the client as little as possible. Um, again, it's game type dependent and a fast-paced uh, first-person shooter. You might not be able to implement uh, authoritative uh, server design, but at least look at things like uh, player health, player ammo, experience, keep all of those server side. Um, and then when there are exploits, um, try to react as soon as possible. Again, this shows commitment to the players and this shows that they can trust you as a game developer to take care of this problem. Um, and then like for the, you personally, like make, try and disconnect from the problem, especially if you're involved with the actual game development. Um, don't engage in warfare, like there's no point in going on Twitter and starting like a flame war between people. Um, also try not to make it personal, like it's a technical problem you're solving, it's not necessarily a people problem. Um, and also within the company try to isolate kind of the, the people who work on the anti-cheat from the actual game design. Even though they need to talk to resolve some of the structural issues, you don't want that your daily stand-up meeting revolves around cheating and that everyone forgets that like, you're making a game, not an anti-cheat. Um, and then finally, don't underestimate because uh, cheating is not solved overnight. Um, it's always like an, an ongoing thing. Um, and then kind of final takeaway, whatever you do, like behave like a duck. Um, Always keep calm, um, show that you're in control, show commitment, but on the background, just work as hard as possible to get it fixed. Um, so that's all. We still want to quickly thank the guys from Valve and Cheat for having us here, and uh, thanks for listening. If you have any questions? And A common cheat we see is uh, speed hacks where people uh, change the timing that the processor returns. Uh, what's a good way to counter that? Uh, so if the question was, how do you stop the cheat engine from making the game go faster? Uh, yeah, what they basically do is we call a function that asks, okay, how much time has passed since the last frame? And they yep. override what that function returns. Okay, so there are a couple of ways to solve this. Uh, you don't really want to do anything like you know measuring how fast this client's running or these kind of things. Uh, so what you can do, ex example, is uh, preventing cheat engine from accessing the game memory. So if the cheat engine as an external process, if it's not allowed to access the game process memory, read or write to it, then it cannot hook those functions and return new bogus values. 
some other things you can do is, for example, uh, like what was in the cheat pages about interface hooking. Uh, you can also do things like you can redirect your own system calls uh, to uh, like um, copy the code that does the same thing. So whenever your game client is calling, for example, the query performance counter that in this case is calling, uh, it, it's not going to call the speed uh, cheat engine's uh, speed act model hook because the code is actually just calling directly the native routines. Uh, so this is like, for example, one of the cheat techniques that you can do. But uh, I would recommend uh, just preventing the memory access in itself. Um, maybe just one other thing still that you can do is because uh, in order to write to memory like cheat engine, for example, hooking the functions, you need to be able to change page protections. So if you take that technique away, that they are not able to make the code page, for example, writable, then they are not able to place that hook there and take control. Hope that makes sense. Yes, thank you. Good. Hey there, could you guys give like a quick summary of the service that you provide? Like easy anti-cheat. Um, maybe really quick, because we didn't come to like advertise, um, but it's um, like we're basically an outsourcing service. Uh, so that's the key focus. We just wrap around the game process, uh, don't integrate deeply but then we take responsibility of all the cheat-related problems. Um, so that's also why we um, focus on a full stack. Like we do, a, we have a kernel driver for prevention, we do detection, and then on the back end, we use a lot of different techniques to analyze gameplay behavior and also code flow behavior. Um, and is that something that you like work with the individual developers on, or is it more like a blanket solution that's applicable to a lot of games? It's applicable to many games, but it needs integration with the game itself. So yes, we work directly with game developers to get it integrated. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Hello. Um, my mm. question was, you mentioned that a lot of the games are server authoritative. Like, you said that that can stop a lot of the problems from happening. Mm -hmm. but, um, do you run into a problem where a lot of games are made client authoritative? Like, where a lot of the work is done on the client, and then like we just tell the server what we did, as opposed to the server being authoritative and telling the players what's happening. Um, in the sense that like, it, it's uh, easier to code something client authoritative than it is server authoritative. You know, like, so do you run into that problem a lot where a game engine or a game might just always be doing something client authoritative when they could actually fix it by being authoritative mm -hmm. on the server instead? Yeah, we actually, we see it quite a lot. And I think it's, um, well, especially in older games, you see it quite often. And then I think it's also a typical early access thing to do because you want to iterate your features really quick, get feedback on them before polishing them and implementing them properly. Um, so in those cases, um, we see developers tend to just implement it on the client. If they get good feedback, then they do the whole thing. But uh, overall, it would be for better for anti-cheating in the future and gen in general if we all just went to a server authoritative yeah. model mm -hmm. and we could get people that like that. That's what I meant. Yeah, most definitely. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, <laughs> and, and to that also, like, especially when prototyping, usually things are done on client side and later on move server side. Oh. Uh, and then one thing to remember also, for example, if you're doing, for example, a shooter game, uh, when you're, because the player needs uh, immediate feedback of what is happening when they shoot something. Uh, so there, for example, uh, uh, the usually the engines then have to support for things like lag, lag compensation, you know, predicting and so on. And one thing that uh, we're not sure about, like how to do it yet, is like for example with VR games. Uh, in many games, you see that uh, uh, when player goes to bad position, the server moves them back, and this is completely fine. But uh, if you are inside a VR experience, yeah. I'm not sure if what will happen if you suddenly move in the room. But uh, that's probably something that you know, like uh, some guys are probably already working on. Thank you. Hi there. Do you guys have any advice for developers on what to do when they encounter false positives and they've banned people um, due to a false positive when they shouldn't have been banned? Um, just unban them <laughs> as quickly as possible. Okay. Like <laughs> yeah. And then uh, like communicate about it and like explain the player like why why this happened. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's a tricky thing because like. And it, it's one of the things we also see with detections in general and why we try that like, it's part of the reason for prevention because when you detect people and you need to ban them, then you always run the risk of false positives. 
no matter what method you use. Like statistically, there can always be a false positive or a signature scan can be poorly crafted and trigger legit software. Or then the heuristics, they can just also trigger something very unusual. Um, so in that way, like prevention is always better. Hi there. Um, I've run into an issue where many times I feel like I'm creating a lot of latency by trying to do a server authoritative uh, way of anti-cheat. Am, am I, are my fears actually, I, I, I'm trying to find a way to not be afraid to uh, authorize the player because I feel like I might be creating too much overhead and I'm creating more latency, especially for when, especially when there's like um, a huge distance between players or something like that. It, it, I'm basically asking, am I being afraid for nothing, or is that actually a legitimate fear to have? Um, I would say you are not being afraid for nothing. Uh, like, depending on the engine, of course, but uh, usually uh, you can assume that whatever you see in the code, uh, someone else is also seeing. So, you know, if you have, for example, intention, you know, like, okay, I have this compromise, or like, you know, there's this loophole, uh, if it's related to, for example, user authentication, uh, it's really important to fix it. Someone will find it. Uh, it's really important not to underestimate that. And then, for example, then some compromises might be something that you know maybe no one would try. And they, I would do compromises in places where it doesn't directly impact the game or others don't really see it. Uh, but then, think critical things like, for example, uh, uh, shooter deciding how much damage I'm going to do to the other player. Uh, it's guaranteed that the, that's going to be the first thing they test. Even the opposite, the victim deciding it, because then it's uh, like gold mode is fairly easy to implement. Yeah. So okay. it's right. better to have it server side. Yeah. yeah. Hello, thanks for the talk. Um, so once upon a time, I made Half Life mods and Source mods, and uh, of course, all the Counter Strike cheats were just. Like, people just use them in my game, which is great. Uh, but as a mod developer, you really have no bandwidth for, like, doing anything about that. So what might you suggest for um, people with limited resources to deal with this sort of thing? Um, well, in that case, like, of course, like, we are as an anti-cheat company, but, uh, like, then you actually want to outsource it, I think, like, to save time on the actual game development. Right, but like, mod mods don't make you money. <laughs> oh yeah, right. Uh. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. Is, there, is there anything that's like w within the scope of a single developer that you can that you can do to 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 not r eliminate but reduce somehow? Um, well, there I would look uh, like whatever you use or whatever you choose to do, uh, something that you don't have to spend so much time on your like yourself on it, so that you know it doesn't become your second job. So I think that would be my advice. Uh, yeah. And some basics like uh, obfuscating some parts of the code or like that might help a lot already. Uh, running something like VM Protect or Demida, I would say. Yeah. yeah. And maybe in the community, maybe there's some guy, you know, who might be unfortunately hacking the game, but, you know, usually these guys are also really passionate about the game. So, you know, maybe someone wants to prove that, hey, I can actually protect the game. I know the engine. So. That's you never knows. Yeah. Thank you. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah.